Good morning, dear friends. I want to welcome you to the Sunday morning broadcast from the Mountain View Independent Baptist Church. Preacher Bobby, thank you so much for tuning in this morning. I want to say a big thank you to all the those that listen every Sunday. I appreciate uh, you tuning in and listening. Hope we've been a blessing to you. I want to thank WAF radio station for making this possible, for getting the gospel out to this county and, uh, and good Christian music and uh, getting the preachers to be able to preach the messages out and for everything that they do. We pray that the Lord would always keep their doors open and, and bless every effort that they put forth and for the great job that they do for our county. Uh, going to be back in Revelation chapter 20. Uh, we'll begin in verse, verses 1, 2, and 3 again this morning. And I want to say, uh, invite you out to our church if you don't have a home church. Uh, I want you to know that on Sunday morning at 10 a.m. is our Sunday school hour, and as always, we've got classes for every age. Uh, church Sunday morning services at 11 a.m., uh, evening services at 6 p.m., and also Wednesday night is 7 p.m. for our midweek Bible study, but our young people, uh, Kids Connection, they meet at 6 p.m., and uh, we've got classes and teachers for our every age, so if you want your child in, involved in something, just bring them on out, and we'd love to have you. And so at this time, we'll be uh, beginning in Revelation chapter number 20 and verse number 1. And so let me tell you where we're located, I guess, in case you don't know. Everybody does, though, but... Uh, we're 199 Myers Lane. Just go to the Food Line store, turn down the road that runs between Food Line and Dollar General, and the church is directly in front of you. So you know where we are, you know when we meet, and uh, you are invited. So uh, just come on out. But if you do have a home church, you want to go to that because your pastor will be looking for you. So now Revelation chapter 20, verse number 1. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled and after that, he must be loosed a little season. Father God, as we bow before you, thanking you so much for the gift of this day, Lord, for the opportunity to be in your house to proclaim your precious word. Father, we pray, Lord, for WAF Radio and for everything that they do, that you would ever watch over them, Lord, that you would always, Lord, walk with them and be close and help them in a great and a mighty way. Father, we pray for everyone that's listening this morning, for most of all for the one that's lost and never been saved, that this would be the day they would receive salvation and ask Jesus to come into their heart. We pray for every home, every family. God, we pray for every marriage. We pray for every church, every man of God that stands to break open the bread of life, every pastor, every evangelist, Lord, every Sunday school teacher that that is teaching or preaching this morning, you would anoint them from upon high. God, give them discernment, give them wisdom, give them the words to say and the message of the hour. Lord, we pray for every church, God, that you would anoint each and every church service that meets in Jesus' name. Father, we pray for our first responders, God. We do pray for our law enforcement, our firefighters. Father, we pray, God, for the, our military, for our EMTs. Lord, we pray for the ambulance, for doctors, nurses. We pray for our leaders, our mayors. And God, we pray for the councilmen, those that make the decisions. Lord, but we pray that even from Washington, D.C. on down, God, that you would just convict hearts to turn, that this nation would turn back to you. And God, they would no longer be running away and turning the other way. God, we pray that this nation would draw close. You're the only true and the living God. God, and we pray that this country would turn back to you. We're going to be so careful to give you the praise, the honor, the glory. For it's in Christ Jesus' name we pray, and amen. So I preached on about how an angel came down from heaven, and he laid hold of the dragon, and that brought us all great joy, and how he bound him for a thousand years with a great chain. But I want to pick up on how he cast him into the bottomless pit. Now, cast means to throw with great force. That means that he didn't, he didn't gently lead him. 
He didn't just put his arm around him and guide him that way. That angel picked that old devil up. He wrapped that chain around them arms and around his feet and uh, just like he was being put into prison. And, buddy, when he did, he, he bound him. He couldn't get loose. I don't know if he could even wiggle or not. And when the Bible says that he cast him, it was with great force. He didn't baby it. He just threw him into that bottomless pit. And he, he did so, I believe, with everything that was in him. I got to study a dear friend about the word cast. If you'll notice that throughout the Bible, especially in the Gospels, when it came to fishermen, they would always cast a net. They would cast a net hoping that that net would fall and enclose itself around the fish where the fish couldn't get to it and what they were, couldn't get away. And what they were hoping was, was to cast something in order to bring something else back to them. In a fisherman's case, it was they'd be cast a net. And they were hoping it would, look, it would enclose some fish and they would uh, draw that net back and draw the fish back to them and have a catch that they could eat and then they could sell. But then again, you take that word cast in so many times, especially in the ministry of Jesus, he would cast out. He would cast a demon out of a person and dwelled with a demon. He would cast a disease out of a person that had a disease in their body. You read throughout time that witches and whatnot would cast a spell. It's the act of doing something. But what I'm getting at to you this morning is the fact of it is, is that sometimes things are cast in hopes of bringing it back. Other times things are cast in order to get it away from us. And when the angel comes down from heaven and he gets the old devil and wraps him up and chains him up and binds him, he casts him away. We ain't wanting the devil around. We don't ever want him back. But what he's doing is that he's casting that devil away from society. He's casting that devil away from the kingdom of God. He's casting that devil out of sight, out of mind, out of influence where he can't work, he can't do, he can't deceive, he can't tear up homes, he can't bother churches. He, he's not going to be in God's kingdom. God's kingdom is going to be set up for a thousand years here on earth and Jesus is going to sit on the throne of David and rule this world with, with a rod of iron from Jerusalem. And he doesn't want the devil in it. He has had to deal with the devil all the way from this creation of this world. He's dealt with him when he was in heaven and he wanted uh, tried to get a third of the angels to follow him and, and kick God off of his throne and he wanted to rule the universe. He's had to deal with him in the Garden of Eden in the first family, which is Adam and Eve. He's dealt with him throughout the expanse of time, all throughout Old Testament and New Testament. He's dealt with him because of the New Testament church. The devil has tore up and he's manipulated and he's destroyed and he killed. He is killed and he is stolen. And he has tore up homes, he has killed, he has taken lives, he has taken joy, he's stolen testimonies. He is, he is everything he's ever done. He's an adversary. He's a deceiver, he's a liar, he's a murderer. And God said, I don't want him in my kingdom. And so the angel binds him, throws him in the bottomless pit. And I know that the Bible says at the end of that thousand years, there's just a small window of time that he's going to be let loose. He's going to try it one last time to unite the wicked against Jesus and overthrow him. And that's when he, <coughs> that's his final days, his final hours. That's when judgment comes upon him, and he is, he is out of here. As you say, the lake of fire is his next home. But he cast him into the bottomless pit. The judge has just brought sentence upon the devil. His, his penalty is going to be a thousand years in a bottomless pit chain. No mobility, no voice, has no authority. He'll be in the bottomless pit, and the judge said that's his sentence. He's sentenced to the bottomless pit for 1,000 years. And the thing about it is, dear friend, he goes to the lake of fire after the bottomless pit. Life doesn't get any better for him. Life simply gets worse. And then you're going to find 
if you look in the court system that we have today and if you look at all the shows with the police and the lawyers and the judges and the whatnot, all that, uh, there's not going to be an appeal. He doesn't even have an attorney. He doesn't have a court-appointed attorney. He doesn't have a, he doesn't have one he doesn't have one of these uh, those that are are famous for solving uh, cases and and getting criminals off and, and everything that you see going on it's an unfair system he doesn't get that there's not a high price attorney that's going to take his case there's no public defender going to be assigned to him God is judge God is jury God has sentenced him he already knows the crimes. He knows he's guilty. He doesn't have to prove anything. God already knows. God has kept up with everything he said, everything he's did, everything he's undone, every time he's afflicted as child of God, every time he's tried to destroy the works of God in this world, every time he's tried to unite the wicked against the godly, God knows every time. He's got the evidence upon him. He doesn't need a jury because God is the jury. He doesn't have to worry about a judge because God is his judge. He doesn't have to worry about proof of evidence. God's already got it on him. And so he doesn't get an appeal. He's nobody going to take his case. And that just goes back to what he's already done. What about the times he's afflicted God's preachers? What about all the times that it was the devil that saw to it that Paul was arrested? That the Apostle Paul was shipwrecked. The Apostle Paul was uh, in prison. All that and striped and beaten and stoned. The devils put his people all in a place that, that would cross Paul's path in his ministry. Even he hated Paul to the point. Didn't bother him when he was saw when he was afflicting Christians. The devil said, go, son. But now when he got saved and born again, and now he's preaching for the Lord Jesus Christ, and the apostle, apostle Paul, he hated Paul so much that there was one messenger that the devil called to him. He said, I want you to go afflict that man and don't you let up on him and you do, do so in a way that he'll beg for mercy. And he did just that. He called on God three times. I've got a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of the devil to, to buffet me. God, I need some relief. I need some help. God would have said no three times. He was trying to show Paul that he had grace and not mercy. He was trying to show Paul you're tougher than what you think. He tried to show Paul, look at everything you've been through, Paul, and you're still going. You see, devil, he hates that. He hates afflicting a Christian and not getting that Christian to quit. He wants us to quit on God. He doesn't want us to do anything for his kingdom. He doesn't want us to represent the Lord. He doesn't want us out here working to get uh, the lost saved and to, and to magnify the Lord. He doesn't want us doing anything for the Lord Jesus Christ, and so he sends those to afflict us. You never actually see the devil, but he's behind every bit of it. Every struggle the church has, every split the church goes through, every problem that we have to deal with, I mean, he gets in the church, he gets around the church, he gets outside the church, he tries to afflict us in our home, in our private life. You see, that's what the devil and God says, everything that you ever done to one of mine. I mean, whether it be Paul and Silas in the jail for doing nothing more than, pre than preaching the word of God, whether it be uh, the communists, the ACLU, all those who rule against the church at every opportunity, all those who try to squash out the church, all those who try to silence the church's voice, all those that tell us that the Bible's not real anymore and the Bible's not the truth and we don't have a right to preach it or believe it, all those that try to entice our children away from God and, and from Christianity and from uh, the parents, all those who have done everything through the influence of the devil, well, your God, the devil, dear wicked, dear, dear wicked one, is the fact is he's now been arrested. He's not there to lead you anymore. He's not there to guide you. He's not there to influence you. He's not there to talk to you. He's not there to try to get you to do anything. The God of this world has just been arrested, bound by chains, and thrown in the bottomless pit. I just can't say that enough. And you understand that he shuts off his power. 
He puts his seal upon him, and I'm going to get to that just in a few minutes. And the fact of it is, he shuts the power down. So, wicked one, where's your influence now? Where's the leader? Where's the one that puts those thoughts in your head? Which one's that puts those words in your mouth? Where's the one that has convinced the wicked to go out and shoot and, and mass murder and, and afflict and abuse and to hurt and to hurt these children? That one that, that, you, that where they unite against God and against God's church and against the innocent and, and the weak. Um, that's all gone. You've got no leader anymore. Your leader is in, is in the uh, bound and is in the bottomless pit. However, my leader, the Lord Jesus Christ, is sitting on his throne, promised to him from the Old Testament prophets. He's sitting on his throne. He's ruling this world. You follow the God of this world. And the Christians followed the, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, the only true and living God, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He just, he just had your God arrested. He has authority over your God. And now you're going to face judgment. And you understand the devil is, is in the bottomless pit, the Antichrist in the lake of fire. False prophet that said this Antichrist was the only true and living God lake of fire and everything that you believed in that was not the lord jesus christ has been destroyed now do you think the devil has any pity or mercy on you he does not he just uses people and they find it out just a little bit too late so let me just get on with the preaching and you're going to find nobody's praying for him you remember how paul the apostle paul they pray, prayed and he was released him and 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 Silas, what about the apostle Peter? They prayed without ceasing. The, the church prayed for him, and God sent an angel and just walked him right out of there, just loosened the shackles off of his arms and, his, and off of his wrist and off of his ankles, opened up steel doors, walked him through the gates surrounding the prison, and took him, back, and took him all the way to, into freedom. You're not going to find there's nobody praying for the devil. There's nobody praying on his behalf. There's nobody saying, let's lose him. Nobody saying, set him free. There's nobody has any compassion for the devil because the wicked only have hate and they have blame and they have criticism. It's always somebody else's fault. And when the devil, that big influence, where's your influence in your leadership now? He's bound with a chain. Who is it that sits on the throne? The Lord Jesus Christ. Who is the God of this world? He's gone. He's in the bottomless pit. Who is the one true and living God? That's Jesus sitting on the throne, dear friend. You're going to find that you have followed the wrong one. But now let me move on to the set a seal upon him. You see, his act, nobody's prayed for him. His activity is strictly at the bottomless pit. He can't harm the kingdom. He can't harm the child of God. <coughs> He's not an adversary for the Savior. He's limited to the bottomless pit. It's only the other angels. It's, o it's only it's nobody from, from Christianity. It's nobody from the church. Nobody's in the bottomless pit that's saved. Our God is sitting on the throne. But let me just get to the seal. You said the Bible says that not only that, but he set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more. Have you ever thought about what that seal implicates and what it means? In Old Time and in New Old Testament and in New Testament as well, if you even go to the if you even go to the a tomb that Jesus' body was placed in or a stone was rolled and a seal was put upon it, Anytime something important, any any time that there was something that had to do with the king, there would be a wax seal put on it, and his own ring, his signet, if you will, and even a name was placed in that wax, so that everybody that identified that seal knew who it belonged to. It was always a king or the representative of a king. If it was a package, if it was a letter, if it was anything in this world, it was a wax seal put on it. But the seal was put on it and whoever it belonged to that had authority over it it was their signature their name their insignia their 
picked, their portrait was placed in there. So whoever looked upon that signature knew that that belonged to the king and you were to let it alone. If you didn't have authority, if you weren't the king or didn't have authority acting on the authority of the king, you couldn't open it, you couldn't touch it. And when you find out that now a seal had been put upon Satan, I want you to understand it was God. He tattooed who he was right upon the forehead of that devil. He belongs to me. He's under my authority. I arrested him. I placed him in the bottomless pit. And you understand God takes authority. He wants everybody in that bottomless pit to know that the devil is in that bottomless pit because God said it to be so. God wanted it so. God willed it to be so that God had authority over the devil. He placed him in that bottomless pit. It's on his authority and his word that the angel bound that devil and he wants everybody in there to know that devil belonged under his authority. But you understand about marks. You find the mark that, that God set upon someone in the mark of Cain. He wanted everybody to know that Cain, when he set a mark upon him, Cain said, you can't cast me out. I'm a fugitive. I'm a vagabond. I've got no home. I've got no family. I've got nothing to call my own. He said, somebody's going to kill me when word gets out of what I've done. And God put a mark that no one would touch him. No one would kill him. He was under the judgment of God himself. And God let him live in shame and humility for the rest of his days. And let him know that nobody could touch him except God. He set a mark upon upon Cain. And now is it not fitting? Was it not the devil himself that caused the Antichrist to set forth a mark that if you want to be identified as who you are, that you belong to the Antichrist and you had to take a mark on your forehead or on your right hand that identified you as belonging to the Antichrist. You, your allegiance was to him. You worshipped him. He became your king. He became your God. God, and you now lived in a world with a mark upon you that was your identity of who you belong to. And you understand Cain was under the judgment of God. Nobody could touch him except for God. And the Antichrist, the mark that was put on humanity that you couldn't buy or sell, Unless you received his mark, which would damn your soul to the pits of hell, you could never be saved. Your allegiance was with the Antichrist and the devil himself. Well, your God is bound and got a mark of his own as well. He, he can look upon your mark as belonging to him, but that mark that God put upon the devil, that was a mark that said, you're under my authority and under my judgment. So now you've got the mark of Cain, you've got the mark of the Antichrist, and now you have the mark of God on the devil. God is in charge. He's in control. If you took what... Uh, Truth, if you tried to take truth from the 6 o'clock news, it would look to you like the devil is in control. Chaos, wickedness, crime, everywhere, hurt and hate is everywhere that you see. But if you open this blessed Bible and read, you're going to find God said this was going to happen. And the more people that turn to the devil and turn away from God, the more wicked it's going to get. But you got to read the last book of the Bible. And the fact of it is you're now seeing that God set up his kingdom. God bound the devil. God cast the devil into the lake of fire. God rid this world of the devil. I know he's going to be loose just a few days, just a short time at the end of the thousand years, but that's for a short time and it's end of the lake of fire for him. If you read this book and not get your truth from the six o'clock news from around the world, you're going to find God wins, the church wins, Christianity wins, God takes all this that the devil thought he was winning and he was in control. You're going to find God's always been in control of this world. He's he's saw all this coming. He warned us what was going to happen. He let us give us time to prepare to go through this thing and to be strong and to lean upon him because we are on the winning side, dear friend. We're going to find that the church wins. God is in complete control. 
He took hold and authority over the devil. He cast him into the bottomless pit. He set a mark upon him. He sets up his kingdom. He rules as king of kings and the Lord of lords. No more are we going to have to deal with evil voices telling people to commit heinous crimes. We don't have to worry about the horrendous crimes. The streets are going to be safe. The devil is inactive. He can't hurt. He can't. He can't uh, influence, and you see, no more, no more, no more. No more will he's going to sift God's people as wheat like he did the apostle Peter and caused him to deny Jesus three different times. Uh, the things that we've done in the past, the good thing is this, is that if you are a child of God and you commit a sin, you can get forgiveness. God can erase that thing, put it in the sea of forgetfulness, move on, restore you. He doesn't remember it anymore. But if you commit a sin and the devil is your God, you can't be forgiven. It'll never be forgiven. It'll be held against you. But thank God for a child of God. God forgives our sins. He see he likes to attack when you're weak. We don't ever have to worry about in the kingdom. We don't have to worry about a wicked organization uh, trying to sequester us, to control us, to tell us we ain't important. We're not, uh, and it's, we don't need to even have church. We, we, it's not necessary. We don't ever have to worry about uh, restricting us with this law and that law and that restriction. You ain't got to worry about forcing you to try to wear a mask and tell you we can't meet together. All those things are past. God is running this nation. He's going to set up his kingdom. But notice something else. He loves to attack us when we're weak, does he not? It, did you ever notice it was by design that after Jesus fasted 40 days and 40 nights and his humanity and his body was weak, that's when the, he was led of the Spirit. He said, when God was trying to show us that even when our flesh is at its weakest, we can defeat the devil with the Word of God. Jesus, didn't, in his temptations, three different times the devil came at him he didn't fight him he didn't have to use his authority and his deity as God he simply went to the word of God what God is saying is that when we're weak in our flesh his word is still just as strong and got the authority that it does his never grows weak he never grows tired if we'll just use his word we can defeat the devil we can <coughs> excuse me we can defeat this world and we can live in victory. Well, it looks like my time is come and gone, but I want to encourage you to come out to the house of God this morning. You're invited to come out to Mountain View Independent Baptist Church. We'd love to have you and see you this morning. We want to thank you so much for tuning in. God bless you and have a blessed day.